I want to continue actually somewhat in the same theme. Uh, I was hoping to be with you two years ago and then COVID struck and uh, I had a very busy year lined up and uh, had to put a line through it all. And I thought, what, what am I going to do? Because um, you're not allowed to do anything. When we heard they closed down Wuhan in China, they, they closed down a town. I thought, how do you close down a town? And then we closed down a nation. And <laughs> we weren't allowed to go anywhere. And uh, we just had to uh, do our necessary shopping. And uh, you were allowed to walk for a little while around your home and more or less stay indoors. And I thought God said to me, I want you to write about Moses. And uh, so I wrote this book. I've just been told uh, that there are still some copies here and uh, available, one or two other titles, uh, I guess over on the side there. If you want to take advantage of that, this, uh, I've called it God's Treasured Possession. And uh, really, remember it says in 1 Corinthians 10, all these things happen to them and are uh, written down for our instruction. So it's written to, down as an example. It's that word tupos, type. It's like that's, this is a type. It's uh, two million people. It happened to them. And it's written down. Their story, their journey through the wilderness particularly, I guess, that's written down for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. And so, you know, we're living in a day when people have thrown away compass and map and said, now wander through life. But we've got uh, uh, something written down for our instruction. And so I've really enjoyed working at this. It's, uh, it's 30 chapters, short chapters. You could take it through a month if you like. I've heard of some churches working through it for a month. Um, just uh, studying that journey and the many lessons. I found it really instructive. I found it hard. I'm not a very good writer. And so sometimes you think, oh gosh, what do I do now? And then the whole experience of Moses, finding how God was there for him, you know, it kind of it stirred me again, let's keep going with this. And uh, it, so it spoke to me, it encouraged me, and I believe you'll find it a blessing uh, if you want to take advantage of it being there uh, in the outside there. Okay? So I'm going to pick up some of that. And so I'm going in Numbers chapter 10. Okay, Numbers chapter 10. So we're going to look at what actually is one of the key chapters in the whole journey. You remember when they came out from Egypt... They were really just a rabble, two million of them, but they're slaves. They've never had responsibility. They've never made decisions. They have no maturity, whatever. They just do what you're told, or you get a whip on your back. Uh, that's it. That doesn't build maturity. And uh, they come out, and the whole purpose is they're going to inherit. They're going to take a land. They're going to have to plant crops, make decisions, build uh, yeah, businesses. It's a whole wow, it's a different world altogether. Uh, and the, this journey from slavery to inheritance it really echoes what's happened to us as believers. We come out of slavery, uh, not just to be set free. And, uh, you know, I, I, Hollywood has a, a go from time to time to talk about deliverance from Egypt. They do their great story of deliverance, but that's, that's all. Really. It's like, cross the Red Sea, that's it, run for it, just go, go. And they don't understand. It wasn't, right, there's a big world, run away. Uh, come on, you've got something ahead, something God's planned. There's an inheritance for you. And uh, so I found it so, such a blessing to see some of the principles that are there. This is one of the key chapters where they begin to be transformed from a, a rabble into a marching army. And it's interesting that when Moses hands this rabble over to Joshua, they have become quite a disciplined army. And so he says to them, march around Jericho seven times and don't shout. And they don't. They don't speak. On the seventh day you shout. And by faith the walls of Jericho fall. They have been transformed. They're now somewhat a disciplined army, having been a rabble. And this is one of the chapters where you see that transformation beginning to happen. Moses is told to hammer out uh, two trumpets of silver. You know, we're going to start going now. And now here we go. We're going to move uh, under direction. So I'm going to pick out some verses in Numbers 10. We won't read the whole long chapter, but we'll just pick out some verses. So Numbers chapter 10, we've already seen how he's been told to make the trumpets, as it says in the first couple of verses. And then we'll go to verse 13. So they moved out for the first time. 
according to the commandment of the Lord through Moses, the standard of the camp of the sons of Judah, according to their armies, sent out first, with Nashon, the son of Amminadab, over its army. Verse 17, sorry, verse 17, yeah. Then the tabernacle was taken down, and the sons of Jerson, the sons of Merari, who were carrying the tabernacle, set out. Verse 21, then the Kohathites set out, carrying the holy objects, and the tabernacle was set up before their arrival. Verse 25, then the standard of the camp of the sons of Dan, according to their armies, which formed the rear guard for all the camps, set out with Ahiezer, the son of Amishadai, over its army. Verse 28, this was the order of march of the sons of Israel by their armies as they set out. Then Moses said to Hobab, son of Reuel, the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law, we are setting out to the place of which the Lord said, I will give it to you. Come with us. We will do you good. For the Lord has promised good to Israel. But he said, I'll not come. I'd rather go my own land and relatives. Then he said, please don't leave us, inasmuch as you know where we should camp in the wilderness. You will be as eyes for us. So it will be, if you go with us, that whatever good the Lord does for us, we will do for you. Thus they set out from the, mountain of the, uh, from, from the mount of the Lord, three days' journey, with the ark of the covenant of the Lord journeying in front of them, for the three days, to seek out a resting place for them. The cloud of the Lord was over them by day when they set out from the camp. When it came about, when the ark set out, that Moses said, Rise up, O Lord. Let your enemies be scattered. Let those who hate you flee before you. And when it came to rest, he said, Return, O Lord, to the myriad thousands of Israel. Father, thank you so much for our fellowship here, for our sense of belonging. We're so grateful for it, Father, that you've taken hold of us, rescued us from our independence, our willfulness to become your children, to adopt us into your family. So we cry, Abba, Father. And Father, we ask you now, please, for the Holy Spirit. Thank you again for your promise, Lord, that if we who are evil know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So we ask, Father, let your Holy Spirit come upon us. Please teach us. Come, Holy Spirit, may we hear you in our hearts. Lord, not just information, but really hearing you, Father. Please have your way among us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So here we have this company beginning to take shape, beginning to be on their journey. And as they go, they're shaping up. There are these who are going to carry the holy objects, those who take the right, the left, the rear guard. Hey, they're getting to get a bit of a shape. They must be a, quite a dramatic company on the move with this glory cloud uh, overshadowing them. Here they come, the people of God. In fact, it wasn't until I did the study that I realized how many victories they won actually before they went into uh, the land of promise. They, they won many victories at that last part of the journey as they're shaping up to be the people God wants them to be. But as they're on this journey, it's still quite early on really, you get this interesting conversation, which I want to major on in this session. Come with us and we'll do you good. They bump into uh, Moses' father-in-law and you get this wonderful kind of evangelistic moment. Come with us, come with us. And I want to kind of impress upon us today, this is really the message we're living with all the time. Come with us, come with us. We will do you good. And how I long for a real uh, outpouring of the Spirit in terms of that evangelistic gift that we need amongst us more. I'll come back to that later on. That, that skill, that ability to say, come on, come. And I, I've recently met 
an evangelist who kind of takes my breath away recently. I, I was at the memorial service of a guy called Greg Haslam, known to some of you, had been the minister of Westminster Chapel, wonderful man, and he passed away, I think, last year. And uh, we went to the memorial service, and the last guy who spoke, I didn't know at all, and uh, he came and introduced himself at the end, and we had a fabulous time, and we've been in touch quite a bit since. He told me the other day, he said, uh, I, I went into a store, and there was a megaphone uh, on the desk at the front, and he said to the girl behind the thing, can I use that? <laughs> and, and she said, if you like, I guess. And, and uh, I think it may have been a children's store, I don't know, but he, he picked up the megaphone in the store, and he said, Good morning, everybody. He said, uh, I expect you found COVID very difficult. And uh, uh, he always wears a clerical collar, this guy. And uh, he said, uh, you know, I want to recommend Alpha to you. You'll find that Jesus is the answer. He says this to the store. And, uh, and he, he put the thing down. He said, a woman next to him said, you priests are all pedophiles. So he got a shot of an arrow back. But he said, the woman behind the, the counter said, can you tell me some more? He said, before I left the store, I'd led her to Christ. <laughs> and, I mean, he keeps, every, I get like letters from him or emails or something on Twitter every, every, regularly. I mean, he keeps on leading people to Jesus. He doesn't need a platform. He's just an incredible evangelist. I think, oh Lord, give us some more. It's come with us, come with us. We'll do you good. We wanna, and notice it's not come to us and we'll build a big church. It's come with us, we're on a journey. Come with us, we'll do you good. We are going on a journey. Uh, and here, this, this building I've never been into until these last few days. You know, when I came before, you were in another place. And when I came before that, you were in another place. <laughs> and you've been on a journey. We're on a journey, beloved. And it's not just we're changing location. It's, hey, there's more family, more. Come and join, we're on a journey, we're on a journey. And of course, I know we're not all from this particular church, but... There are other churches out there. We're on a journey. And our invitation is come with us. We will do you good. And I think we should have that bold confidence. Come with us. It's a blessing to be with us. And I think it's a terrific evangelistic verse. All right, come with us. I think if someone came to my door and knocked it and uh, said, come with us, I think I'd have a few questions, wouldn't you? I think I'd say, who are you? I think, I think, I'd like to look at it under this sort of, what question would you ask? And I think I would ask, who are you? And what could Moses answer? Well, I think he could answer this. We are children of Abraham. And this overlaps with what we were saying in the previous session. God spoke to a man and said, through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And so they knew they were carrying God's word to the world. They were carrying, they were the light. They carried a unique privilege. God was with them. And they could say, that's who we are. That's our identity. We are children of this one who has the answer to world history. And we need to know that, beloved, that we're not just religious people, but we carry the answer. We carry the word of God with us. That God has spoken to Abraham. And then, of course, ultimately, it says, through your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And Galatians tells us in the New Testament that actually the seed, seed is obviously a word that can be many, but it's also a seed that can be one, and it's all about Jesus, really, that he is the ultimate seed. And, and so we are, we are saying to people, come with us, because we found the answer to world history. We found Jesus. That's who we are. We're people who are filled with promises from God. And that's what really makes us unique. These promises, we carry promises. I love what it says in Hebrews at one time. Abraham, the man with the promise. The man with the promise. You living with some promises? It's so hard to serve God if you haven't got promises. Don't, don't, it says in Hebrews, be careful. Don't grow uh, weary. Be, be imitators of those who, through faith and patience, inherit the promises. Beloved, we have to live with promises. If we haven't got promises, we're just religious people. God's given us promises. The Bible's full of them. I guess some of you have got these underlined. There are verses in your Bible you underline. I know some people will put the date in the, in the, in the margin when God said that to me. And I want to encourage us. It says through faith and patience. We so often think that faith is now. Claim it, name it, I've got it. But actually... 
often in the Bible, faith is about standing your ground, keep believing, hold it, press through. You get that in all these wonderful Old Testament stories, like Nehemiah with all the hostility, no, we're going to build the city. You know, like Joseph with his promise, you're going to be, you're going to reign, you're going to have, you're going to be a king. Your brothers will lie, to, will bow down before you. Think, wow, how's that ever going to happen? But he kept believing the promise. Keep believing the promise. And so, yeah, Abraham was the man who had promises, and we are people with promises that God has spoken. It's been lovely being back with John and Linda again for a few days, and just recalling those early days of when this church got born, and actually didn't have anything else but promise. There was nothing else around. <laughs> All I had was promises. What a privilege to say, no, I know God's promised. God's promised. You know, we move into Kansas City with promise. We move into this place or that place with promise. God's promised us things. And we mustn't let them drift from us. So Abraham, the man with the promise. So we're, we've, we've heard from God. It's only God can make these promises. And so we're, we're engaged with God. So don't drift from the promises. That's what the whole of the book of Hebrews is about. Don't drift from the promises. Come back to the promises. Then he comes to Hebrews chapter 11 and says that we're surrounded by this cloud of witnesses. And witness, a witness in the Bible is not someone who's observing something. A witness in the Bible is one who speaks. Yeah. I think we often think of that cloud of witnesses that they're watching us running. But it's more they're all shouting, go for it. I'm witnessing to you, Abraham in Hebrews 11. He's faithful. Sarah, he's faithful. Gideon, he's faithful. One of Moses, he's fa- they're witnessing. They're witnessing to us. They're bearing witness. They're saying, you can trust him, you can trust him. Don't turn away from the promises. So we ca- who are we? We're people carrying promises. We're carrying promises through COVID and out the other side of COVID. It's important. We, and we mustn't let the shadow of this COVID time, which has been so tough, I've heard of hundreds of pastors in the US who've said enough. They're, not longer, they're no longer pastors. And they just said, I can't do this. It's too hard. And it is hard in America. There are political issues that get in the church. Think, what on earth has that got to do with the gospel? But you guys have to fight your way through it. I often pray for you guys. I feel my heart aches because in a way that we don't have in England, you have battles to fight with political issues, why didn't you do that? Why did you do this? And why you do the masks thing? Was that in or out? It's like it's a big issue. People leave church on it. Think what? And we have asked in England, why are they doing what? Oh, they didn't do this. They didn't wear the mask. They did wear the mask. You didn't vote for him. Why didn't you vote for him? Why don't you say more? Huh? What about this? Political issues in America come right into church life and make it so hard for you guys. And to be honest, in a way does not happen in Europe. It's not relevant. I mean, they're there, but they don't invade church life. So I, my heart aches when I hear you know, hundreds of pastors say, oh, I've had, I can't do this anymore. Now we've got to live with promises, amen? Yeah. We say, no, God's, pro- God's promised. <laughs> it's not me trying to have a go. It's not my profession. It's not I thought I'd do this for a job. <laughs> God's called us. We haven't any... You know, we don't have any choice. If you know God's called you, then you've got promises. And we keep living through and we win because the promises will prevail. And beloved, we as leaders have to, it's tough for leaders more than anybody else, but you've got to keep proving that. So we're people with promise, amen? Who are you? Well, we're children of Abraham. He's the man who has the promises. And we've got promises from God. That's what will prevail in the midst of real setbacks and difficulties, we have promises. The second thing they could say is this, we're rescued slaves. We're rescued slaves. Well, there are two stages to that, really. First was the, the rescue from judgment. You know, God said, I'm going to judge Egypt. I'm going to deal with the Egypt. Egypt is a, a dreadful place where they want to slaughter babies, there's all kinds of idolatry, and God says, I had enough. We know the story of the various plagues, the opposition, the hostility. God says, enough. I will judge this nation. And it's quite plain that Israel were worshipping some of the idols too. They had taken part in that. But God made this promise to Moses that every home must take a lamb 
It has to be a spotless lamb. It mustn't be one that's diseased. We don't want that one. Give that one to God. That's not the deal. It's not, a, it's not a lamb you don't want. You know, that one's no good. We'll give it to God. No, it's got to be a perfect lamb. No disease, no imperfections. And you take that lamb and you slaughter it. And you put the blood around the doorpost. Now, we have to know who we are. We are people for whom judgment is past. The, the, God came over and judged, he judged, he judged, he judged. And it must have been terrifying. Every home, every home screams as the firstborn of every home dies that night. The, the nation must have been filled with screams and, and weeping. But these, these, these homes that had the blood of the lamb on them, you know, I guess it was the temptation to open the door and look at the blood and think, doesn't do much for me. It's not meant to do much for you. God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over. And we have peace with God because he's satisfied. Beloved, it's so important. That's the basis of my peace with God. He is satisfied. He is satisfied with the blood of his son. It's not that I had a good prayer time this morning. It's not that I read my verses. It's not that I did that. I did that. It's because the blood satisfies God. And, and, and these Old Testament priests, they, they keep on doing offerings. They keep on. They, they never sit down. They're offering another one, an offering. Jesus, when he had made one offering, sat down, having perfected us for all time. Do you know you're perfected for all time? Do you know that judgment is gone? And so many of our dear people in our ranks, they battle with condemnation. They do. They battle with it. How are you getting on? Oh, I'm not so good. I'm not so. And people battle with it. They need to know. No, Jesus has taken away my guilt. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He's done it. He's done it. When I wake in the morning, I'm righteous as a gift. We need to know that. We need to teach people when they pray. Don't start. People teach people to do this. When you start praying, start with confession. Clean the decks. Such a terrible mistake. The Bible doesn't say that. It says, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. You're taken up with Father, not with sin. Prayer is not a sin-wallowing time. That's why a lot of people hate prayer, because it's such hard work. Because they, they're so sin-centered in their thinking when they come to God. And some people want to say, well done, very good. That's bad. It's bad. It's saying, no, that's who I'm a sinner. I keep sinning. And we need to say, no, no, that is not true. He has perfected us for all time. Bunyan gave that wonderful uh, testimony, John Bunyan. He said, one day I was feeling low, I was walking, feeling low, and he said, I saw a vision. Wonderful, Puritan saw a vision. Right? So he saw a vision of Christ as his righteousness. He said, I realized it didn't matter about my frame. That's the word he used. You know, my frame of mind, how I feel. And they, that old hymn, I dare not trust the sweetest frame, it's like how I feel. I don't trust that. He said, I suddenly saw Jesus is my righteousness. I couldn't do anything to add to it. And I couldn't do anything to take away from it. He is my righteousness. And it's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, beloved, we need to know that. Who are you? We have been saved through blood. We're righteous before God. We need to preach it, teach it, make people know it. Paul, you look at his epistles, he's constantly hammering this home. You're righteous through the blood of Jesus. It's not your performance. And so many believers get tied up with performance. And am I doing well? No, the blood of Jesus cleanses me, sets me free. So who are we? We're Passover people. We keep on taking Passover to remind us. We keep celebrating the feast. We're declared righteous. Who are? Come with us. It's not like, oh, we're defeated sinners. Some people want to argue, well, Paul said I'm the chief of sinners. Well, see, really? Is that what you really think? Do you really think Paul was the chief of sinners? Do you think that's what he, that was his life? Follow me, actually, I'm the worst sinner on the planet. <laughs> now, people will argue this. Godly people argue. Oh, Paul said he was the chief of sinners. What do you think he was? I mean, how, many, how much money did he steal? How many women did he abuse? I mean, I, no, no, no. He's talking about, you know, I slaughtered Stephen. This is what you, I used to be. He says, he says that elsewhere, I have a clear conscience before God. Right. Yeah. 1 Corinthians 4. 
I know nothing against myself. That's Paul. I know nothing against myself. And some believers, some wonderful Christian leaders, men I know and love, want to keep on insisting because we're really sinners. And if you teach that, you will get that. And then when people sin, they'll say, well, we are sinners. And it's so bad. It's so wrong. We need to understand, I am in Christ. I was crucified with him. I've been raised with him to newness of life. And there is no condemnation because of him. He's the one. That's why we celebrate him so much. He's taken away all my guilt. I used to think if I had a bad quiet time, oh dear, God wouldn't be with me today. I could sleep through my quiet time. Now I'm still righteous. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. See, if we, don't un- if we don't believe that, then you're just religious. You're working at religion. But these people are unique. They are Passover people. They know my guilt has been judged. It's already been judged. The lamb died. I'm accepted. That is such an important truth for us to get into our saints. We're all leaders here, but we've got to get into the saints. But they know it. They know it. They've been set free. They're Passover people. The judgment has gone. And the next thing they could say is this, that we were slaves. We were guilty, but we're not guilty anymore. There is no condemnation for us. That's all gone. (laughs) But now, wow, I I can't get out. That would be their story. Ahead of them, there's the Red Sea. And then they think, oh boy, here comes the army. Chariots, horsemen, spears, swords. We're defenseless. We're finished. And I felt that. As a young Christian, I felt that. I thank you, Lord, for forgiving me, but I still feel like I'm a slave. The stuff my old slave owner, he could knock me down any time. I just mess up all the time. And then, hey, the sea opened up, and they actually were delivered from slavery. Again, that's something we've got to preach to our people. Like it says in Romans chapter 6, you were a slave of sin, Now you are, identity, you are a slave of righteousness. That's a completely new identity. We've just got to believe God says that's true. It's true because he says it's true. It's the truth that sets us free. And so, beloved, you can't restate this too often to teach people who they are in Christ, that they died and they've been raised again. There's a sense in which you should be able to say to your congregation, how many people here are dead? Isn't it? That's what it says. It says in Colossians 3, you have died, you've raised. And we should, we should not get blank faces. We should say, hands raised. We've all died. We've, been, we've now been raised to newness of life. If that hasn't happened, we're just religious, trying to keep up a moral standard. Working hard at it, praying at it. No, there has to be truth that we know is true. And so who are you? Well, we used to be slaves. We're not slaves anymore. We are not slaves anymore. That could be, come with us, we'll do you good. We're ex-slaves. We're ex-slaves. We're freed. I was in a church this last weekend, three of the elders were former alcoholics. (laughs) They're free now. They've been set free. We've been set free by the good news, hallelujah. So when we ask someone to come with us, to, to know, hey, we've been released. If we, haven't, if we don't know that. I know when I was first saved, I didn't know that. And I, I used to go to parties and get drunk and all that. It was my lifestyle. And I became a Christian. I still carried on doing that stuff. And then I thought, no, I've got to be a proper Christian. It was a crisis for me. I've got to be a proper Christian. And then my friends would say, coming to the party. I said, no, no, I'm not coming. Oh, yeah, be loads of girls, lots of ma- boo- booze. Come, you'll love it, you'll love it. No, I'm not coming. Why not? I'm a Christian. I'm not allowed to. You know? Then you'd see them next week. What was the party like? Oh, it's wonderful. You would have loved it. You know, I think I would have done it. You would have loved it. <laughs> then I'd say to them, why don't you become a Christian? Then you won't be allowed to go to the party either. <laughs> That's where I was. I lived through that. You're not allowed to. You become a Christian, you won't be allowed to. Now, if you haven't seen, no, no, I've been set free to something better. Yeah. Hallelujah. But many in our ranks, they're fighting those battles. And it's not about willpower, it's not about morality, it's about truth. 
of what happened at the cross and how Jesus set us free. We've got to preach it, that we know. No, we're freed, we're out, we're not there. And then the next thing that happened, who are you? Well, we were invited to Sinai. I, I, I was working on that chapter, it says, Moses took the people to meet God. That really fascinated me. Come and meet God, imagine. He's met God, the burning bush. He's like, wow, God, God, take your shoes off. He's on his face, <gasps> God. Then he goes down, go and get them. He brought, they'll bring two million. Come and meet God. I remember meeting my parents-in-law. Scared the life out of me. <laughs> we, Wendy and I met at Bible college. Now, I'd, I've not met her parents. who are. I'm from an ungodly background. They're Christians, centuries of Christianity. I mean, I've got to meet these, ooh, what do I call them? So I say, mum, dad, what, what do I call them? What do I wear? You know, I'm going to meet the parents-in-law. <laughs> Moses says, come and meet God. <laughs> <laughs> and so two million people come to a mountain and if a bush burned for Moses the whole mountain goes incandescent for the nation it's like lightning, thunder a trumpet that grew louder and louder and two million people heard the voice of God imagine God speaking to us and they say Moses you go up and talk to him it's like whoa <laughs> and then God says I'm for you I'm yours Imagine, I commit myself to you. You're mine. We're a covenant. We're betrothed. Amazing. Who are you? Well, we're kind of betrothed to God. <laughs> extraordinary. Who are you? Well, we're in this extraordinary relationship. God has revealed himself to us, and we're his. Come with us. We belong to God. Well... I think my second question would be, where are you going? Come with us, we'll do you good. This is who we are. This is where we're going. Where are you going? Well, I love Exodus 15. It's the first worship song in the Bible. Exodus 15, where Moses sings and the nation joins in the song of Moses. It's a fabulous song. Who is like unto you? Mighty in power. You know, they came after us, you made them, they sank like lead. The horse and the rider fell into the sea. Oh, it's just a fantastic song. It's just worship is celebrating God for who he is and what he's done. It's, it's a response to God. It's not us initiating, it's not some songwriter, poet writing a few words. It's saying, God, you're breathtaking. And, and I love, I love, I, I actually think Exodus 15, it's a song of praise I actually think, and I haven't got time to go into this now, I think that tongues and interpretation are probably meant to be like that. All right? We haven't got time to stay here. But he that speaks in tongues glorifies God. So we need to interpret so we can appreciate this. But in this song, it starts with, who is like you? You're this, you're this, you're this. Then it goes on with revelation in it. You will bring us into the, into the mountain to the sanctuary. It's like, who do you know? How do you know where we're going? You know, once they're over uh, the Red Sea, they could go anywhere they like. No, no, you will bring us in. It becomes prophetic. It becomes prophetic. And I think for many of us, the gift of tongues interpretation, which has almost gone out of fashion, has often been because some of us, when we were saved, we heard the phrase, a message in tongues, and it was kind of prophetic. We thought, oh, no, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says it's Thanksgiving, it's yeah. Godward, therefore. And we come to meetings, and someone speaks in tongues, and there's a kind of a silence, and somebody panics and prays a prayer. <laughs> All right? I think that's what's happened. <laughs> All right? Yeah. All right? This, this has happened. <laughs> and in the end, people think, why do we bother with this? Yeah. Why do we bother with this? Because, well, it wasn't very exciting. I think we need to ask God, please restore to us the gift of interpretation. I know some brothers who've got a wonderful gift of interpretation. And I love being in the meeting when there's a tongue and they're there. Because I, it just, it's, just, it's more than a prayer. There's something in it that opens up. You think, wow. Yeah. It's not a message in tongues, but you see this... I always feel this Exodus 15, it starts how great you are. It finishes with you will bring us in. You'll do this, you'll do this. There's revelation in it. 
So uh, that's an aside, all right? But I feel that. And, uh, and so there's this terrific song, You Will Bring Us Into the Land. Well, we've touched about that a little bit in the earlier session. We are going into the land. In the Old Testament, it was a few square miles at the middle, end of the Middle East, in the end of the Mediterranean. Now, we're going to all the world to preach the gospel. Jesus said, all authority. The Jewish Messiah says, I've got all authority in heaven and earth going to all the world and preach the gospel, even to Nepal, as we just heard from Tim. Go into all, who's going to Nepal? Gracious me, it's miles away. I know, but we're touching, we're touching, we're touching. People are going, people are going, because we're, come with us, not come to us. We're on a mission, we're on a mission. That whole seeker-sensitive thing said, we will know how to make you comfortable with us. What's your felt need? We'll look after it. And we have a really good Sunday school and we'll look after you. But the danger then is we say, well, now we're going to plant over the other side of town. You're going where? That doesn't really suit me at all. (laughs) You see, they think the church is about them and their felt needs. And we say, no, no, we're not. We're built on an apostolic foundation, not a pastoral foundation. That's what the Bible says. Now, past, we want the best pastoring you could possibly have. Good shepherding, beautiful shepherding. We want that. I'm not playing that down. But if shepherding is the foundation, then you looking after me is the top value. Because shepherds should look after me. Feed me, heal me, look after me. That's what shepherds are for. If that's the identity of the people, well, you're going somewhere. Oh, God bless you as you go. No, we're going. We're on a mission to the world and that's part of what's amongst us in our ranks that's why we're going again we're going again we're going to another town we're going to another place we're going to another nation that's the way it's got to be and so the, the land for us now isn't, it isn't the land of Israel it's the land all out as many many places as we can go to all nations that's where we're going and then it says in, again in Exodus 15 17 it talks about the city Zion. Now that's, again, it's symbolic. Jerusalem is an actual town. And and David, by this time king, wants that city. And under David, Israel becomes a kingdom. Before it's 12 tribes. You know, Saul doesn't do well, but David is the Lord's anointed. And he establishes them as a kingdom with a king. This is they're taking on identity now with a king. And this wonderful king writes loads of psalms. And that's by teaching them the songs, he's teaching them their identity, the songs of Zion. Because Jerusalem becomes called Zion. It's that place where God dwells. It's where the temple is. It's where God is, it's his holy place. And so Zion takes on all kinds of more meaning. In the Psalms, it's like, my feet are inside your gates. I was born in Zion. Zion is a location, it's an identity, it's a people, it's a citizenship that in the Old Testament is pointing forward to what's going to come in the New Testament. So in the book of Hebrews, it says, you have come not to Sinai with burning and flames, you've come to Zion. We Christians, we have come to Zion. This dwelling place of God, and to Jesus, the mediator of a better covenant. So Zion is where we live, it's the people of God. And so we're, we're saying to him, come with us into this community. Come and be part of us. It's not just come to Jesus. Praise God for come to Jesus. Praise God for Billy Graham, every great evangelist, praise God. But ultimately it's come and join if it's without joining, it's, we've missed the way. In Acts chapter 2, it says 3,000 were added. It doesn't say they were converted. They preached the gospel, they received, they were added. What were they added to? They're added to the community. God's building a people, a community. And so here, come with us. Where are we going? Well, we're going to the land. We're going to build Zion. We're going to build a city. And where God will be with us in this community. It says about Moses, he was looking for a city with foundations whose maker and builder is God. This community, God wants a community. And I know that's the thing that burns in your heart. It says in Psalm 46, there's a river whose streams make glad the city of God. 
this city that's set on a hill that can't be hid. We can't spend any more time on that, but God wants a people. They're a recognizable people. A city. In the end, the holy city is revealed. The book of Revelation shows us that city. Somebody said this, the Bible is the tale of two cities, from Genesis to Revelation. In Genesis, you get Babylon, and you get the beginnings of Jerusalem. Babylon, that city without God, that city that says, no, we can build without God, and Jerusalem. And you go right through to the book of Revelation, and Revelation, you get Babylon, that great city. It speaks of worldliness, independence of God. We can do it without God, Babylon, that. And then it says a book of about chapter 19 of Revelation, Babylon, that great city has fallen in one hour. It's gone, that great city. Then it says Jerusalem, the holy city, coming down out of heaven like a bride. That's the only thing that's going to last. When God wraps up the whole thing, the only thing that will last is the bride. It's the, it's, the, it's the story of creation and history. The bride of Christ. That's what it's all about. God will wrap it all up like a garment. And he'll start anew. Only the bride will live on. Only that city. And we're part of that. We're going to be building a city, a community. We want to do that. We want to build that. And we need to be inside. My feet are in your gates. Oh, Jerusalem. And we need to be encouraging people who get saved. Come and identify. You know, in practical terms, come and join our small groups. Come and get, in, get known, get loved, get cared for. As Toppy would say to people when they join his church, what, what, what team do you want to join? Pardon? Well, we've got a PA team, we've got a music team, we've got a children's team, and we've got this team. Uh, what team do you want to join? It's like, well, I pick up, yes, you pick up. A place. You pick up a place. And that uh, brings me to my last point, really. What happens to those who join you? Come with us. Who are you good? Who are you? Where are you going? What will happen to me if I join you? These are reasonable questions. And he says to him, whatever good the Lord does for us, we'll do for you. You become part of this blessing. But also it says this. You can be eyes for us. That's a fascinating kind of New Testament sound to that. You can be eyes for us. It's not like, well, there's two million of us. Uh, join at the back, try and keep up. It's not that. You can be eyes for us. What is In the context, it's like, you know where we can camp. Now, you're not taking over. We're following the cloud, all right? It's not we're looking for a new leader. We're following the cloud. But you're familiar with this territory, so when we stop, you know. That's where you can be eyes for us. That's what Moses says to him. It's like you have a role. You have a gift. You have an insight. You are valued. So when people join us, it's not like get to the back of the queue. It's like, I wonder what gift you're going to contribute. I wonder if you'll be prophetic. What, you know, it's fascinating. It says in Acts 19, directly these people... Paul laid hands on the, the dozen or so who got saved and filled with the Spirit. They began to prophesy immediately. Immediately. He says, all may prophesy. Yeah. Philip had four daughters who prophesied. A prophesy, prophesying, you could be eyes for us. You can get revelation for us. You can bring to us that sense God is with us in the midst. That is what you can be. You can be eyes for us. You will have a role to play amongst us. So beloved, when we're bringing people in, let's try and channel them into what is your gift and what God has for you. We're his workmanship, created in Christ for works he prepared beforehand that we should walk in. So when someone gets saved, there's a role for them. There's a part they play. Come amongst us. We'll do you good. I guess one last question you could ask is, how come you're so confident? Well, God, he says, the Lord has promised us. We come back to that beginning. The Lord has promised us good. Amen? Amen. Do you believe that? The Lord has promised us good. Let's, let's invite. Let's encourage our saints to invite that we might be the people God wants us to be.
Amen. Come with us. We'll do you good. Let's have that confidence. We're carrying the blessing of God. We're carrying his favor. We're carrying his presence. Father, thank you so much that you ever invited us in. Thank you for the day we heard the gospel. The day you called us out of our darkness into your light, out of our ignorance into the knowledge of God. And Father, just ask you right now, please, for your spirit to keep leading us forward. And I pray for every church represented here this morning that, Father, we might bring you great glory, that we might see many added, many brought in, many finding their place, many whose lives are terribly distorted and confused to step into the light and into the family of God. Hear us, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.